All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Wagner. I'm the chair of the Hatfield Ag Commission. And I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, it's an exciting program on an evening with pollinators. I want to recognize the members of the Ag Commission who worked on this, Russell Powell in particular, who will be one of our speakers tonight, uh, John Pease, uh, Tom Petson, and Betsy Speeder. So uh, with no further um, ado, I will uh, 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 call on Allison Fowler, our first speaker tonight. Uh, Allison is with UMass and a researcher there, but I'm gonna ask her to, um, to unmute herself and actually provide a little bit of a background on herself while I uh, make her the presenter so she can share her, um, her, uh, uh, her computer with you and begin the presentation, okay? So um, I'm gonna make you the host, Allison, and uh, you should then be able to share your screen if you wanna get started. Thank you very much for participating tonight. Thank you. Um, so let me, wait, let me make sure I'm sharing the correct, um, there we go. Okay, can you see my, yes. my slides? Okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Bob, for uh, having me and Russell for organizing this and inviting me. I'm really excited to be a part. Um, I am a graduate student at UMass in the uh, Department of Biology and I'm in the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology uh, program. And um, yeah, my research is on bees and how we can figure out what um, plant species are good for their health. Um, so I'm not really gonna be talking a lot about my specific research, but rather giving kind of an introduction to the group on um, bee kind of bee biodiversity and some common um, members of the bee community here in New England that you might see in your garden or on your farm. And then I think the speakers after me are going to be talking more about what specific um, management strategies or plants you can plant to help uh, promote those bee pollinators. So yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to start off with this beautiful um, poster that I recently came across, which is um, done by the Pollinator Partnership, which is this organization that, oh, I guess I'll be admitting folks as they come in through the waiting room. Um, so Pollinator Partnership is this great organization that um, does a lot of um, work towards promoting pollinator diversity and conservation, and they put um, they put out these posters every year. And so this was the poster I think from last year that I just thought was really nice. And it even, it just reminds me a lot of the like landscapes around here. Um, and so I thought some of you might enjoy it as a nice little picture of the ecosystems that we're gonna be talking about. Okay, so first I wanted to kind of give a uh, introduction to why we need pollinators. I know you, probably many of you already have this information, but just to get us all on the same page. Um, pollinators are absolutely crucial for our food production and uh, sustainability. Um, so this was an experiment that Whole Foods did, I think a few years ago, um, where they took a picture of what our normal grocery store looks like with all of our available produce, and then they, took away everything out of the produce section that would not be available if we didn't, if we no longer had our um, really important insect pollinators. And so this is just a really kind of like shocking image to make us realize how actually vitally important um, these animals are for our food production. And so kind of to get us all caught up with the background, um, when we think about pollinators and pollination, sometimes it's easy to forget like what's actually going on here and what actually is pollen. And most of the time when people think of pollen, this is what comes to mind, you know, allergies and like tons of pollen in the street on the springtime covering your car. Um, but in fact, what pollen actually is, is the 
male gamete for this plant. So uh, in order for the plant to reproduce and to fertilize the seed, it has to have the pollen reach the ovule on a separate plant. And so those plants that produce tons and tons of pollen that create all these allergies and get everywhere on our cars, those, uh, those plants are primarily wind pollinated. So they produce just tons of tons of pollen. Um, but other plant species, like a lot of our crops, have um, you know, evolved such that they don't produce mass amounts of pollen, but rather they recruit animals to move their pollen from plant to plant. So there's potentially less um, pollen wasted. And so um, a lot of these plants need, have figured out a way to recruit animals by providing them with these resources such as nectar or pollen. And, um, and so these pollinators then transfer the, um, the pollen to new plants. So now that we uh, have the basics of pollination, we understand that it's vitally important for our crop production. Let's get into now meeting all the characters of, um, of the story. So we have lots of different animals that can act as pollinators um, because uh, plants can produce such um, great nectar and protein rewards with the pollen. Um, lots and lots of animals are attracted to, to flowers. Um, most primarily though, insects are gonna be the most common pollinators, um, but there's also birds, bats, and other mammals. So here are a couple of my favorite pollinators. We have hummingbirds, also some bats, probably won't see bats pollinating flowers here in Massachusetts, um, but you know, just in other ecosystems around the world, different, different animals can, can do, provide this service. And so what I'm gonna be kind of focusing on now for the rest of the talk are uh, bee pollinators. And bees are kind of the poster child of um, pollinators because they um, solely eat nectar and pollen. They don't get their food from anywhere else. So that is their main job is to be out visiting flowers. And many of them have then evolved to have really good structures on their body for transporting pollen um, because they take that pollen back to feed um, their offspring. So they're super hairy. They have these like compartments on their body and on their legs that help them pack their pollen. And you've all probably seen bees like honeybees and bumblebees that can kind of like collect the pollen in this little pollen basket on their legs. So they look like they have these huge clumps of pollen hanging off their legs. Um, and so that's one um, way that they're able to transport the pollen. And <laughs> this is one of my favorite little cartoons of like what I imagine it's like to be a bee. And um, you can see that they just get covered in pollen from head to toe. And this actually isn't that far from, from reality. So this was a bee that I caught a couple of years ago. Um, and this, far, this picture on the far right is what it normally looks like when it's not covered in pollen. And you can see when I caught it, it, was, it looked like a yellow bee because it was just absolutely covered in, in the pollen. So now I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the the wide biodiversity that uh, encompasses this group of insects that we know are known as bees. And most of us immediately think of kind of honeybees when we think of what are bees, but honeybees are just one of the 20,000 species of bees in the whole world. Um, and 20,000, just to give you an idea, that's more than all the birds and mammal species combined. So there is a whole lot of biodiversity within bees. And here in North America, we have about 4,000. And here in Massachusetts, we have um, a little over 400 that are documented. So we have lots of bees here. And um, unlike the most kind of common or known species of bee of the honeybee, most bees are actually solitary. So that means they don't have a queen or colony. And most um, also live underground rather than in like a cavity or, you know, trying to get into your garage or something. They're all just most of them are underground. Okay, um, so here's a quick kind of snapshot of some of the amazing diversity that we have um, both in the world and then on the right hand side here specifically in North America. Um, so you can really see how absolutely beautiful, how amazingly diverse they are in terms of size as well as color patterns. 
um, and shapes. So to give you some kind of scale, this bee right here is one of the common com um, carpenter bee species that you're likely to see. So, you know, that one's like, you know, figures your end of your thumb or something. And so you can see how it compares. That's like the monster of all the bees. And it compares to some of these tiny species up here, which they're so small, you would probably never even notice them on a flower. Um, you have to really be searching hard for them. So I think that's part of why we know so much about these like big species like honeybees and bumblebees and so little about these other, all these other species because they're just so small and they're really hard to study. Okay, so now I'll introduce us to some of the common species of bees here in New England and how, um, which crops they are primarily going to be pollinating, so maybe ones that you can look out for on your farm. So I'll start off with the one that we most of us know about already, which is the honeybee. And this, as I mentioned, is one species, or there's multiple species of honeybees, but around here you're most likely to see um, one species called Apis mellifera. Um, it was introduced to the Americas from Europe, um, and so it is not native to North America. Um, however, it can still do a really great job at pollinating tons of different kinds of crops and other flowers. Um, so it's, it's used a lot in agriculture and as, as you all know, it's managed. So it's um, either we have escaped bees sometimes that we refer to as feral colonies, um, but most honeybees are, um, I think around here are managed and kept by beekeepers. Um, and one other really important and kind of unique um, quality of honeybees is that they are social, meaning they have one single reproductive queen in a colony, whereas um, all the other bees in the colony are non-reproductive females. And these colonies can be absolutely massive. Some of you probably know there's tens of thousands of them in a single colony. Um, okay. So the next group that I'll briefly go over are bumblebees. And unlike the honeybee, bumblebees are, there are a bunch of native bumblebee species here in Massachusetts and North America. There's about 50 species in North America. Um, I'm not sure how many in Massachusetts, probably like, I've seen like five or six. Um, and they are actually, there are two species in North America that are commercially available. So this box here, you can actually go online, order a box of bees, and they will, they can get shipped to you at your farm or your greenhouse, or we order them to do research with them in the lab. And you can see kind of right here, if you look really close, is that tiny, that's one of the little bees coming in to, back into the colony from um, pollinating in this greenhouse um, full of tomatoes. Um, so they're really important for the greenhouse tomato industry because honeybees do not like being inside an enclosure. Um, so any kind of greenhouse crop, bumblebees are the primary pollinators for. Um, they're also generalists like honeybees, so they visit lots of different kinds of uh, crops and flowers. Um, and they also, in addition to being able, being able to function in an enclosed space like a greenhouse, they also are able to do this behavior called buzz pollination, which is where they actually grab onto the anther of the plant and shake it and that releases the pollen. And so not all um, bee species have this behavior. So a lot of um, like honeybees, for example, if they come and visit a tomato, they're not gonna be able to actually release the pollen because they don't have that behavior. Um, bumblebees are also social bees. So they also have a queen kind of like honeybees, um, but their colonies are much smaller. They don't get into the tens of thousands. It's more like in the hundreds. And so here's a little quick preview of what a bumblebee colony looks like. Um, that I know there's kind of a lot going on here. So on the left-hand side is what a colony looks like, you know, if, when all the bees are not moving. And then in the middle is kind of a little movie showing an active colony. And this is, um, one of the colonies that we um, reared in the lab and have in a plastic container. And we use the red light because they can't see red. And so we're able to see, but they can't see. So they don't know what's going on. Um, and then all of these little kind of like, like bump 
the lumpy structures in the middle of the colony, those are kind of zoomed in here and peeled back. It's the offspring of the bees underneath this wax layer. So it's kind of like the honeybee, like a uh, hexagon structure, but it's not quite as organized. It's just kind of like piled on top of each other. Um, and so the offspring develop underneath those covers. How am I doing? Okay. Um, and so bumblebees, I like to promote as like a first step of, uh, if you're interested in learning more about bee biodiversity and I, going out into the field and identifying bees, um, bumblebees is a good place to start because they are easy to identify. They're big, they're slow flying, so it's easy to catch them and ID them. Okay, so unlike honeybees and bumblebees, which are social, most bees, like I mentioned earlier, are actually solitary, so they don't have a queen or a colony. And like I said earlier, most nest underground, but they can also under, uh, nest in other places like hollowed out twigs or shrubs. So ground nesting bees, I like to point these out because, oops, um, a lot of times, you know, we see kind of holes like this and a lot of us don't really know what's living under there. <laughs> And some people might get nervous and think it's like a wasp nest or an ant nest or something. So they'll like stamp it out or spray pesticide on it or something. But um, try not to do that because it could be really important bee species that are living under there. And their nests could be really close to the surface or they could be several feet down, like is demonstrated in this um, diagram right here where they dig these tunnels down and then they um, have these little individual uh, cells um, where they provision a single egg into each one of those and then close it up. Um, and oftentimes you might see the female bee just like poking her head out there as she's kind of defending the nest. And so a couple of ground nesting bees that you're likely to see or that, and that are really important pollinators are Andrina. Um, Andrina are kind of also known as mining bees. Um, but they are a hugely, hugely diverse group. There's so many species of Andrina and I'm not good at identifying which species are which, but a lot of them are really important crop pollinators, um, especially for apple around here. They are specialists on squash uh, and cucurbit, so pumpkins and other gourds. Um, and so if you have pumpkins, you've probably seen the squash bees coming in and out of the flowers early in the morning. And this is actually a really great resource I recommend to folks if you have squash or other cucurbits and you're interested in like promoting your area for more squash bees. Um, I can put this link maybe after the chat I can, or after this, I can put this link in the chat. It's a little downloadable like guide about how to promote squash bees on your farm and more information about their biology. They're really cool. Okay, and the last group of bees that I'm going to go over are the cavity nesting bees, and these are also solitary, but instead of digging a hole into the ground, they'll either dig out a cavity in wood or they'll use an existing cavity that they find. And so you've probably seen and heard about these bee hotels as like vacant kind of cavities to encourage bees to nest there. Um, and I think these are a great resource for folks who want to improve the bee populations. Um, however, I do think there are certain recommendations for main, uh, maintenance for it, just to make sure that they don't get like parasito parasitoids and other diseases and stuff. I'm not totally familiar with the best practices for keeping these bee hotels, but I know that there are a lot of people who use them and they're, they can be really successful. So um, that's another potential like route for um, supporting bees if you have um, that interest. And so some of the cavity nesting bees that are in our area are the leaf cutter bees in the genus Megachile. They're really important pollinators for lots of crops and they're really fun to watch if you manage to find one while it's trimming some leaves to take back to its nest. They line the nest with the leaves and then lay their eggs inside um, the nest and it protects the, the, protects the developing larva and it's like this little antimicrobial sleeping bag for them. It's really quite cool that they do this. So these bees you'll see around um, collecting pollen and nectar as well as collecting little leaves. Um, and then this, this photo is really cool because as you can see, there are three different kinds of nests in this same block of wood. So this top row is the, the leaf cutter, as I just mentioned. The second row, you can see these cells are divided by um, 
resin, bits of resin. And I don't have the information about which species this was, um, but there are lots of species of resin bees that are also in this same uh, genus and family. And then the lowest nest here, or in the bottom, is a mason bee nest, where each cell is divided with mud um, rather than leaves or resin. Um, and here you can see their um, cocoons, so they're further in development than these slurry. And so these mason bees that lay these or make these kinds of nests at the bottom, um, we have lot, we have a few species of Osmia here in Massachusetts, and they are really important pollinators of lots of uh, spring fruit trees. So they come out early in the spring. Um, they're super cute and fuzzy. Some of them are blue like this. Um, and there, yeah, I have one little uh, fun fact is that they are super, super efficient at pollinating apple and other trees such that you just need 600 Osmia bees to do the work of potentially tens of thousands of honeybees for um, pollinating these kinds of flowers. So um, in terms of pollinator efficiency, they are really good at that uh, group of flowers. Okay. And so finally, I wanted to end with um, that, you know, we, we have honeybees and we manage honeybees and other, other bees like bumblebees now, um, but that protecting and promoting our wild pollinators are also really essential for um, crop production and diversity. Um, and so there are lots of studies that have come out recently that have found that a wide diversity of pollinators in the community uh, results in better pollination services, whether that's number of uh, seeds produced, number of fruits produced, the weight of the fruit, or the like misshapenness of the fruit, um, all get better when you have a wider variety of pollinators in the community. Um, and this is because they have a wide variety of traits. So, you know, we have the specialists as well as the generalists that can kind of fill in the gaps. We have bees that differ in size, um, like the huge bees and the tiny bees that can get into those tiny flowers, and then differences in behavior. So there are, like I mentioned, the buzz pollination, um, as well as there are lots of other flowers such as alfalfa, where the bee has to kind of do a certain behavior in order to like activate the um, pollen release. Um, it like triggers a thing where the pollen gets deposited on the bee um, in that case. And so certain bees can have this behavior that activate the pollen release and some bees don't. So all in all, promote our wild pollinators um, to supplement as well our managed bees. And with that, I think I might have gone a little over, but hopefully not too far. And I'd love to take any questions and I guess kick it to our next speaker, we'll talk about so how Allison, to Allison, I'll, I'll jump in here really quickly. Thank okay. you very, very much. <clears throat> Allison, if you could um, uh, go and uh, remove yourself as the host, if you, uh, if you sure. will. And um, Ooh, Russell- Who should um, I make the could, host? Uh, you could make it me for right now. How's that? Okay. And um, Russell, if you could unmute your uh, speaker and be able to speak soon, that would be great. Um, I did, uh, I'm sorry, I meant to mention that there is the chat. If anybody has a question they would like to um, put into the chat, we can collect those and then uh, present them to, uh, to the speakers after we're all done. Um, but Russell, with that, I'm gonna make you the host um, so that you can uh, you can actually now share your screen and um, and begin your presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Russell Powell, a member of the Ag Commission, and also uh, has been with the uh, Apple Growers of New England for a very long time. So, Russell, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Bob. Um, I do have this long history with the apple growers, but I also uh, began a project back in 2010 to remake my lawn, which had been, uh, I had a few gardens, but it was mostly lawn. And uh, I began not thinking about pollinators. I looked at it, my front lawn it was a huge area near the road. I never walked on it, the grass didn't grow well. And it just seemed silly to be um, mowing it every seven days. 
So that began a project that led to uh, a book called um, Living Without Lawn. And uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about today are some general principles about ways that you can uh, improve your home yard to make it better for uh, pollinators. And I wanna start by addressing some myths. Um, you don't have to give up your lawn. You don't have to become a gardener. You don't have to spend more time or spend more money to make life better for pollinators. You can do any of those things. I have, <laughs> I'm more of a gardener and I spend a lot of time in the gardens, but um, that's me. You don't have to do that in order to um, really make some significant improvements for the pollinators. So uh, what you do need to do is adjust your aesthetic. Uh, moving away from the monolithic view of the lawn, which we all grew up with, and um, not getting rid of it, but tweaking it some, uh, making some judicious choices here and there to uh, keep your basic uh, yard, but uh, make it better for pollinators. So um, here's uh, a, a photo of some of my yard. I, I enjoy having some lawn, it's nice paths. It makes a nice uh, backdrop for some of the flowers. I enjoy walking in my bare feet on grass and I love the smell of freshly cut grass. So this is not uh, an anti-lawn uh, diatribe. Uh, I do see a role for lawn, um, but there are many reasons to use less of it. Um, there's the gas, there's the noise and air pollution, and of course, pollinators. But uh, more than that, I think that one of the reasons that we should think about less lawn is it's, it's more interesting to have flowers and shrubs and other possibilities throughout the year rather than just this flat landscape all the time. Um, so in rethinking the lawn, um, I thought of a few factors. First of all is that uh, I, I rarely see the whole lawn at once. There's no place in my yard where I can look out and see the entire yard. Um, secondly, uh, grass grows at different lengths, at different times, depending on where it is in the yard. The soil may be better in some areas. There may be more sunlight or moisture. So uh, there's not this just kind of monolithic uh, view. Um, and uh, third is I don't use all of the lawn the same way. I, I, do, I just don't walk on all of it. Parts of it, out, particularly out near the road, um, I never set foot on them as a lawn. So these are these were all good reasons to think about um, kind of compartmentalizing my yard. Instead of thinking of it as this one thing that has to be treated the same way every seven days, to think about it more in terms of uh, its individual sections. So for example, uh, when the white clover is blossoming, it's very low to the ground, I leave it. For another week or two, I mow around it. So I'm leaving that food for the pollinators. Um, last summer, I discovered a bumblebee nest in the ground. And instead of running for my can of Raid, I just put a, a log near it so I remembered where it was and was able to preserve that bumblebee nest for the rest of the summer without in any way interrupting my appreciation of the yard. And um, I've had milkweed sprout up in places. Milkweed is particularly attractive to monarch butterflies, as I think many of us know. And um, it popped up in the grass a few places where I never walk. I look out there, but I never walk there. So I let the milkweed grow. So, you know, those are some very simple steps. I didn't have to do anything other than change my attitude a little bit about, um, about the uh, lawn and, and what grows there. So, um, you know, the grass does uh, choke out some, uh, some pollinators, but the, the other thing that I, that I think that will be true for some owners when we have our power mowers, it's the easiest thing in the world to add to our lawn without even thinking about it. We're on the riding mower or we're pushing the mower and we get to the edge of the lawn and geez, I can just take another swath. 
And I'm suggesting just the opposite. Maybe think about those edges of the yard in a different way. And instead of adding to the lawn for no good reason, maybe think of doing one less swath. So you're creating a kind of wildflower buffer around the edges of your property, which again, does not impact your ability to throw a Frisbee or a softball or walk toward your gardens, but will create a much better environment for the pollinators. Um, I do work a lot with the uh, apple industry and uh, New England in the first two weeks of May is a stunning place in the orchard. If you have not had a chance to visit an orchard in full bloom, it is definitely worth it. Um, but the season is underway now and uh, our pollinators need food now. So uh, the early varieties like crocuses are uh, a good choice. And uh, as you see from this example, you can plant them right in the grass. And that has a couple of advantages. It gives some interest to a part of the landscape, which normally would be very drab at this time of year. And crocuses in particular are not planted as deep as say tulips or daffodils. So if you put your crocuses in your flower bed, there's a risk that you'll dig them up later in the summer when the foliage is gone and you're looking for a space for a new perennial. So you can avoid that by putting them in the grass. And I always recommend that you get at least some of your flowering bulbs that are naturalizing, meaning that they will spread on their own. And that's clearly the case in this photo we're looking at. That it was probably, uh, sorry about that, so it was probably just a handful of bulbs that started that. And now you see they're all over the yard. And by the time the grass is green and it's time to mow, these will be long gone. The mower can go right over them and they'll be there uh, next year. Um, but this leads to one of the easiest things that people can do. Again, if you're not naturally drawn to gardening, you don't want to spend time in the lawn, uh, ground covers are a great way to get started. And uh, here's one, creeping phlox. Uh, it just creates this mass of flowers. It's low to the ground. It's early in the year. It's later than the crocuses, but it's still relatively early in the year. And for much of the 12 months, it just has a foliage that is neither here nor there, but when it's in bloom, it is spectacular to look at and feeds a lot of bees and wasps. Um, another one like this is Lamium. And I mentioned this because the picture I'm showing you was the first or second year that I was given a small clump by a friend. And now this covers about 20 times that area and I did nothing to it. It spreads on its own and uh, uh, it's a, a great example. You see the yellow flowers on it. There are other colors. There's a pink one, there's a white one. But in many cases, you just have to plunk in that first ground cover and you don't have to do anything more and you're, you're helping the pollinators. Uh, another example of that is ribbon grass, which does not flower, but it still provides habitat. And when you're thinking about pollinators, it's not just food, it's also habitat. So uh, ribbon grass is very good in that respect. Just don't make the mistake that I did years ago. I did put some in a flower bed and uh, to this day, I'm still trying to take some of it out every year. So you'll be careful with some of these ground covers, put them in a place where you can really let them go. Another virtue of ground covers is that they're so adaptable. These painted ferns thrive in the shade. So if you live in a place that has a lot of trees and, and very little sun, it doesn't mean that you can't help your pollinators. And these painted ferns is a good example of that. Um, another thing you can do, kind of like ground covers, it's very easy, are flowering shrubs. Uh, they take up space. They will grow and fill in more. They'll take away some of that excess lawn and require very little maintenance. In some cases, you may prune them or shape them. But generally speaking, you put those in the ground and uh, you don't have to think about them anymore. And you see they provide a lot of food for pollinators. Um, I like to look to nature for ideas when I'm thinking about my garden. So you take a plant like mullen, which is commonly known as a weed. You can buy it at nurseries, but uh, when I grew up, it was typically referred to as a weed. 
It um, grows tall, it can grow six feet or so, has yellow flowers in midsummer. And um, once it's flowered, it's not very attractive. You probably want to pull it out. But until that point, it not only feeds a lot of pollinators, but you see when it's this young in the spring, it's actually really a stunning plant low to the ground. So um, don't give up on a plant just because you've heard it called a weed. We have milkweed and butterfly weed and iron weed, which are all very popular in our, in our gardens, but uh, we have our hierarchy of plants and, and, uh, and they got the bad names. Um, another example of this would be purple vetch. I hate it when it's in my flower beds, but here you see a great example in nature of how the, the purple vetch and the yellow crespus work very beautifully together. And it's not just the flowers, it's the contrasting foliage. So uh, sometimes you can get ideas in nature that you're not gonna uh, apply directly. You're not gonna go out and plant purple vetch in your garden, but it gives you an idea of how that purple and yellow can be so striking together. And then you take something like Queen Anne's Lace and you look at this one on the left and it's got multiple pollinators on it. It's got the honeybee in the foreground, but it's got two others smaller bees uh, up above. And uh, this grows everywhere. And uh, I don't want it in my flower beds, but out by the road, I let this go. And uh, boy, it is beautiful when you can give it the space and the bees clearly love it. So just because something doesn't work out in one area uh, doesn't mean it can't have a very powerful effect somewhere else. And another thing that the um, Queen Anne's Lace shows you and a lot of the other uh, scenes you'll see in nature is that uh, bees like masses of flowers. They're not only nice to our eyes, but they're nice to the bee eyes. So you take something like Rose Campion and a single plant of it looks nice um, when you get it all together. It's uh, really stunning for our eyes and, um, and the bees love it. So um, be thinking in terms of lots of uh, the same variety. Um, here's a contrasting example. This is cardinal flower. And you see close up a single flower, it's stunning. So imagine 50 of these together. <laughs> um, you know, it's gonna benefit the bees, but I don't know who gets greater benefit. I think that we do just by looking at it. And this one I picked out because it is, uh, particularly valuable because it requires moist soils and it blooms toward the end of the summer. So just as you're thinking about early summer plants with crocuses, you also want to extend the season and have some plants like cardinal flower, which come in at the end. In addition to looking to nature, I also look to the pros, our farmers. And here is Butternut Farm in Farmington, New Hampshire. And uh, they've planted a big block of perennials to uh, supplement the pollinators that they bring for the apple trees. And one of the things I like about this is the inclusion of what we would call weeds. There is Queen Anne's lace in here. There's this tall um, goldenrod. There are several other plants which um, Butternut Farm has just let flourish in here and they all work together. It's visually beautiful and it just adds to what's available to the pollinators. Um, our farmers are at the forefront of this. They understand the value of pollination. And here's another example of an orchard. This is at McDougal Orchard in Springville, Maine. And uh, when I took this picture in August, the uh, apple trees had long been pollinated. They were pollinated back in May, but the growers understand you got to give them food all season long and um, produce this beautiful garden of globe thistle and uh, coneflower. And uh, you can't really see it from this picture, but if you were looking close to this, there are at least 12, I counted at least 12 bumblebees in this picture. So it's very popular. Um, sticking with the farmers one more time, uh, Chuck Souther of Apple Hill Farm in Concord, New Hampshire says, nothing leaves the orchard except the potassium in the apples. Everything gets reused. And um, as I mentioned earlier, part of what we're doing here is improving the habitat for pollinators. So 
we have this tree taken down. These stumps, they're too big for splitting. They're too gnarly. So uh, I found a way to just kind of reorient them in the yard while they're breaking down so that they will eventually become uh, a, a place to shelter uh, pollinators. And in the meantime, uh, we get to look at something a little different and interesting. And this is another example. You take those same uh, big logs, which are not going to be easily splittable for the fireplace, and um, create some height and some bulk in a part of the yard that was otherwise quiet uh, on their way to becoming um, suitable for, uh, for pollinators. And this is their final resting place. This is now a couple of years later. I stacked them up on the edge of the property beneath some hemlocks. And uh, from this point on, they are now available to uh, be used by our pollinators. Um, one of the big issues that comes up for uh, many people getting into gardening is this uh, idea of invasives. Um, in my experience, almost, I would say maybe three quarters of the plants in my yard could technically be described as invasives. It is the job of all these plants to propagate as effectively as they can. So my strategy is not to eliminate invasives, that would be virtually impossible, It's to manage them. It's to pick the ones that you like and that you're willing to take the time to manage rather than say, oh, I'm never gonna get an invasive. Because if you say you're never gonna get an invasive, um, you'll see actually the list is pretty short. And there are some other reasons to consider some of these invasives. The two you're looking at here, amaranth and morning glory, they're both annuals. Uh, years and years ago, probably at least 10 years, a friend of mine gave me some seeds of both. I have never planted them again. And every spring I have hundreds of these. And um, I will say I have to pull out many of them from places I don't want them. But there are other areas, particularly out by the street, where let them go. And uh, they do a great job and provide additional support for the pollinators. It's not only that, you look at something like Budlia or butterfly bush, and in many parts of the country, this is considered a weed. It's considered invasive. But its name tells you the story. It is very attractive to butterflies, like this spice bush swallowtail but it's also covered with bees and it does spread. It grows tall. It can be six or eight feet tall and has to be cut down every spring, but it is an enormous resource for our pollinators. Another example is apple mint. Uh, you need a space for it, but you see in uh, early spring, early summer, it has this beautiful, soft, fragrant foliage and by mid to late summer, that foliage is sprawling. It's four or five feet tall. The, the stalks hang this way and that, but they attract all kinds of pollinators. So here's an example of uh, one of our non-honeybee um, pollinators. And I love these blue guys. And you see they have no problem coexisting with the honeybees. And uh, here's another one, this little orange guy here. So, you know, it's a plant that uh, from a strict gardening point, people might look at it and say, oh, apple mint, it goes everywhere. But if you have a spot in it for your yard where you can let it go, uh, look what it does for the pollinators. It, it is, I'd say of all the plants in my yard, this is the one that attracts the greatest variety of pollinators. So I wanna end just by, uh, reviewing a, a couple of basic things. If you have not done much with your yard, my advice is to make incremental changes. Don't try and do this overnight. You can start small with just a couple of um, ground covers or a shrub or two, or maybe a small garden. You don't have to do it all at once. Second is to extend the season. And I've talked about this, how it really begins in March and it goes to October and our pollinators need to eat that entire time and they have to have places to shelter year round. So um, think about the entire season and not just one part of it. Another is to experiment. 
Um, one of the other things you learn from nature is it's very forgiving. If you make a mistake, if you don't like a color combination, who cares? You can just change it up the next season. And um, I think that you'll find better results if you're willing to, to take chances. Um, toward that end, um, uh, I wanted to just back up and say a couple of things. Uh, toward that end, uh, the other issue that comes up with invasives is native versus non-native species. And I think it's a bit of a misnomer because most of the plants in our yard that we think of as native are in fact not native at all. They seem that way because they've been here now for hundreds of years in many cases, but a lot of what we think of as natives um, actually uh, came from other shores. And I think that for me, a better guide is what does well in my yard without uh, chemical intervention. There are several plants that I love that for whatever reason, I just can't seem to grow here. Delphinium is one. And, um, and rather than just year after year, purchase more plants, put more inputs in the soil, um, I've come to believe that a better strategy is to just accept what I have here and recognize that there are almost always suitable alternatives. There are plants that can give me the same color, the same foliage, and I would rather work with nature than um, get fixated on a particular variety or a particular um, logic about, say, native plants and, um, and, and work with nature. Next thing is to share. In my experience, gardeners are an extremely generous group, both with their knowledge and their plants. And I spend lots of money at our local nurseries and they do a great job. But in my yard, I have dozens and dozens of plants that came from other gardeners who are happy to share their surplus. And it's another way you can keep down the costs is just by networking with other gardeners. Finally, or next to finally is have patience that, um, you know, that's one of the things that gardening has taught me is nature takes time. And it may be that you have a vision for a field full of cone flowers, like the one pictured here, and it may take three years for it to happen. You may have one or two plants the first year and uh, four to eight plants the second year. And finally, the third year, they double again and you've got a critical mass. So um, don't expect to achieve your goals all in one season, but it all is to the good. And finally, observe and enjoy. The best thing I can say about this is it gets you closer to your landscape. For most of us, our houses are our biggest expense and we barely uh, walk on much of the land we pay taxes on. Um, sometimes we just uh, outsource the care of that lawn. Um, and by paying a little more attention to your pollinators and improving their uh, habitat, you will become closer to your landscape. You will get more benefit out of seeing your flowers close up. Look at this cone flower. It's beautiful 20 feet away, but look at how uh, complex it is close up. And same with the honeybee, uh, the bumblebee on it. You get this tremendous view that you wouldn't otherwise get. So those are some general suggestions I have. And uh, I hope that you give some of these a try to make your yard uh, more, uh, more beautiful and effective for pollinators. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Russell. Uh uh, Russell provided us with a, a lot of examples of uh, plants and varieties uh, that you could use in your garden. Uh, Allison provided us with a lot of examples of species of pollinators. Uh, you probably couldn't all write them down, uh, but we will be making and we have made a recording of this program and we will have that available on the town's website. And uh, I'll also, uh, I will be able to, you'll be able to access the uh, recorded program so you can then go through it and see each of the varieties that Russell was talking about and the species that Allison was talking about. I'm gonna ask um, Harrison uh, Bardwell to unmute his, uh, his microphone. Harrison is a farmer in Hatfield and uh, Harrison's gonna talk to us about how he is a farmer 
relies on pollinators and what he does to enhance and promote pollinators for his operation on Main Street in downtown Hatfield. Harrison, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm just gonna do some verbal talking here. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, yeah, I run Bardwell Farm in Hatfield. For those of you that don't know me, we're a 30 acre diversified vegetable farm um, running a wholesale business, uh, mainly farm stands, CSA and markets. Um, we're a year round production doing a plethora of different vegetables, um, which is why I'm here. So um, we grow a lot of different crops and some of those crops entail things like leafy greens and brassicas and uh, sweet corn, crops that don't necessarily uh, need pollinators to grow, which is which is pretty uh, unique uh, also. Um, but we grow things like peppers and tomatoes and summer squash and cucumbers and flowers even that are all really essential to pollinators. And without the pollinators there, I essentially can't really create an income out of that because I would not be able to really harvest or get a yield, it's called, off of these things I planted. So we rely really heavily on both native bees and honeybees that are managed um, on and around the farm. We, <clears throat> we work with a local beekeeper actually in Northampton that has a bee yard in the back of our farm uh, that has about probably 10 to 15 different hives there that he one produces honey from, but also two provides pollination for the surrounding area. And I was always told bees can travel anywhere from up to a, a mile in their given area. So um, we're really looking at yield potential. And uh, a couple of things we look at is the yield potential from the pollination. We're looking at the fruit set on different crops, uh, the quality of the fruit set um, with the different pollination. If you have poor pollination, say, say like last year, we had a really rainy season and the bees might have not been out all the time, that could actually create issues with our yields and, and the quality of the crop. So um, having those better conditions to, to be able to pollinate different crops is really essential for, for, the, for the business itself. Um, <clears throat> so it's really important to, we rely on those, but we're also relying on other local areas to attract those pollinators, either around our fields, um, in the backyards of your houses, we have a lot of, you know, different fields. I think Hatfield's pretty unique where we have a lot of farmland that's kind of in one general area, but there's a lot of small little farm pieces or properties uh, that people are farming in the backs of people's houses and all around. Uh, I think it's a very, the Pioneer Valley is very unique to that. So, you know, utilizing the homeowners or, you know, or uh, land around us that we might not be able to bring, you know, honeybees in to help pollinate crops. Um, we can really try to rely on homeowners that have, you know, flourishing uh, pollinator gardens or wildflowers um, or even, you know, field edges. So a couple of things we'll do is either one rely on, you know, native or wildflower species or pollinating crops um, to help lure in uh, pollinators to help pollinate our crops, but also give them, you know, a food source throughout the season, because a lot of the crops we're growing are requiring pollination, maybe only a couple times throughout the year, maybe only once out of the year or all throughout the season, depending on the different crops that we're growing. So, you know, relying on both, you know, maybe a bee yard and those native pollinators um, and kind of giving them an area to kind of encompass all throughout the year is pretty pretty vital, vital to us as well. Um, a couple kind of different things I want to touch about that people might not think about is that in a production ag system, we're working with different things like pesticides, um, chemicals, fertilizers, uh, machinery, and um, the pollinators can be really susceptible to uh, certain things. And pesticides is a big thing that I just want to touch upon quick is uh, most production farms are spraying different pesticides to help prevent against um, disease pressure or insect pressure. And um, I wanna specify uh, insecticides, um, which are used to prevent uh, issues on or diseases on multiple crops. 
um, but they can also have a lot of harmful effects on different pollinators, which can either kill them um, from you know eating or touching the plant from pollinating, um, which could one, kill off a species, but two, also really lower your chances of good pollination for that crop. So what I do for a good practice on our farm is to really um, be really diligent of the pesticides that we're spraying to make sure that we're not spraying um, crops that are either in flower, make sure we're not spraying those pesticides at all when they're in flower, um, being mindful of what those pesticides are, a lot of them have labels right in the first couple of pages, you know, explaining that. Um, so, I mean, this can even kind of go down to homeowner stuff is if you're using some kind of pesticide to maybe manage a disease or different insect is to really make sure if you're spraying a flowering crop to be mindful of those things, because you don't want to be, you don't want to be harming those species that are in turn actually helping us. Um, so again, we're relying on those wildflowers and 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 the bee yards to bring in those pollinators for our different crops. And um, I've always been told that native bees actually do a better job at pollinating than the bee yards that we bring in to manage. But centralizing bees in certain areas, um, especially during peak uh, flower pollination periods of crops, um, really does help boost our yield. So. Um, like I said, we have a we have a bee yard in the back of our farm, um, which is very beneficial because the Hatfield Community Garden is also right next to us, which um, houses a lot of um, wildflowers and other flower species just from the gardeners. Um, so that's giving a home for these bees for one to um, you know do their thing, get their pollination, and. Um, it's kind of a, it's a cool rotation here because we're getting the pollination from those bees. I try to plant crops, you know, in the general fields around that really do cater to needing that pollination. Um, but it's also helping the local uh, community garden help pollinate those flowers. Um, in return, giving the beekeeper himself uh, the pollen to create the honey that bees produce. And you know, this is the other side of things is that uh, honeybees specifically uh, produce honey, which everyone knows, but um, it's just another source of income for specific farmers. So I'm utilizing the bees from him to pollinate my crops so I can produce vegetables like your tomatoes and your peppers and your squashes. In return, he's gathering that pollen from the crops for the bees to do their thing and produce honey, which then he sells to make his product. So it's this cool relationship where, you know, farmers are working together, um, you know, community members are working together, the wildlife is working together to create this, this ecosystem where everyone's kind of bene benefiting from it, as long as everyone's doing what they need to do within that system. And I really see that benefit beneficial of, you know, I'm helping someone out uh, to create a business and income for themselves. I'm also helping and giving a place for these bees to go and, you know, pollinate other either households or citizens in the town for, you know, pollinating their local flower gardens or even their own vegetable gardens. Um, so I really like that kind of communal touch to, to that itself. Um, at the same time, giving me a lot of uh, extra boost in production with the yield we'll get off, off that pollinating, those pollinator bees. Um, yeah, uh, his name's Rob Zwicky. He runs uh, Pioneer Valley Apiaries. He's a small guy out of Northampton. And he does a couple cool things where he actually produces honey, but he also is, he has a bee yard where he actually raises bees. So um, as I think Allison was talking, is you can buy actual boxes of bees to either put on your farm or bring into your house, or not into your house, into your yard to um, help pollinate different areas. And so that's really, that's really essential to the other farms in the area that want to bring in a better source of pollination um, and also helps his business out as well. Um, so yeah, that's how bees are beneficial to myself and my business. Uh, without them, we would not be here or like that picture Allison showed, we'd probably be growing about a quarter of the things that we were capable of growing. 
and producing. So uh, thank you to local pollinators and honeybees. We are able to produce crops to be able to feed ourselves and to feed uh, the local community. And um, without them, we wouldn't really be here probably. So um, with that said, one last thing is uh, our farm stand will be opening uh, probably in the next week or two. So look for some fresh veggies out on the stand before you know it. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, Harrison's farm stand is right on Main Street uh, between the library and town hall. You can't miss it. So, um, well, thank you, uh, Harrison. Uh, really appreciate your time tonight. Um, Josh, I'm going to uh, make you the host. Josh Rose is our final speaker for the evening. And um, uh, Josh, why don't you take it from here? Uh, you are the host, so you should be able to share your screen whenever you want. All righty. Um, hang on, a couple people just got into the waiting room, so I'm uh, hopefully none of them are Zoom bombers. Um, all right, and uh, with that, um, Okay, and all right, so um, thank you for having me in here. Um, and thanks to, to Mike Wanzik, who is the one who, uh, who put me in touch with Russell and um, Russell and all to get me involved. Um, so I'm going to uh, discuss some of the particular plants that uh, you can that you can grow in your yard to make it a happy place for pollinators. Um, if you look across the bottom of my title slide here, those pictures there are pictures of our yard here in Amherst. So uh, it's an area when we moved in, it was actually a row of pine trees screening off uh, the neighbor's house from ours. We like our neighbors and didn't necessarily want to screen their house off when the trees got a bit too big. So we had them moved. Uh, and when the, the trees were gone, uh, had the open area seeded with native wildflowers. And as you can see, is a big success. Um, so uh, plant-wise, starting off, this is one that Russell mentioned earlier, the butterfly bush. And as he said, big magnet for pollinators, especially butterflies. And uh, I've got one moth in here too, which I'll discuss in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, and it's a great nectar plant, but it actually has um, some shortcomings um, in part because it's a, it's a non-native plant. Uh, and this has very, one very specific impact. Um, so, and that is that while it's great for nectar and you see all sorts of butterflies and such on it, uh, it is not used very much by anything for its larva, for caterpillars and, uh, and other, other pollinators larval stages. And so it's only getting about half the benefits that many of our native plants do, um, which I'm going to uh, run down a number of them. Um, and I've got some other non-natives, non-natives to include too, but um, so uh, I will start with, here's one that um, not many people may associate with pollinators, the black cherry. It's a tree, it gets quite large. It does have flowers. Um, there's sort of spikes of tiny white flowers. They do attract some pollinators but its big value is actually as a larval host. Um, it, it can be loaded with caterpillars of many different varieties. And I've got a couple here of, that, people may, uh, that people may recognize, for instance, the uh, tiger swallowtail, which uh, huge, brilliant yellow and black butterfly that we see flying around all summer on the bottom right there. Uh, bottom left is its caterpillar. Um, 
sort of green with some fake eye spots and it, it loves cherry foliage. Um, top left is not a butterfly, it's a moth. Um, many of you probably know the Luna moth, a big green one. This is one of its less common cousins, the Promethea moth. And like the tiger swallowtail, the Promethea moth has caterpillars, which are big fans of black cherry. So, um, and there are some nurseries, not all of them, but some of them do sell uh, Prunus serotina, this species of cherry um, that if you plant it, uh, lo loaded with caterpillars and by being loaded with caterpillars, it is a great food source for a large number of birds that um, where the, the birds don't benefit so much from nectar, but caterpillars are a huge part of the food, especially for chicks when the birds are nesting. Um, and so having a heavy load of caterpillars can support a lot of, uh, a lot of baby birds that are, uh, gr that are growing up in the nest. I'll also mention uh, bottom right, uh, the, the tiger swallowtail photo, you notice I have quite a number of them packed together in a spot in there. Um, uh, another thing that you could do that benefits a lot of your yard biodiversity is composting. And in this case, uh, we used to have some pet guinea pigs and we had compostable bedding for the guinea pig cage. And in this case, we were composting some of the guinea pig, some of the soiled guinea pig bedding. And it turns out the minerals, the minerals contained in guinea pig waste are in many cases highly valued by butterflies. And so this is a party of uh, tiger, tiger swallowtails going to town on the, the uh, guinea pig waste products. Um, okay, and for some reason my slideshow is, oh, here we go. Hmm. It's having some trouble advancing here. There we go. Um, yeah, so milkweeds, uh, which Russell mentioned, and uh, we have, um, and most people are, you know, anyone who's kind of looked even a little bit into pollinators probably knows about milkweed. Um, we do have multiple species of milkweeds around here. The, the one that often comes out without, that sprouts up in our yards frequently without any help, the common milkweed is the one on the upper right with the sort of pinkish flowers. Upper left with the more intense purple flowers is swamp milkweed, which uh, likes wetter areas though can tolerate some dryness. And then top center, the brilliant orange is called butterfly weed, um, but is another milkweed species. Um, you see in the middle, mil milkweed is a popular nectar, nectar source as you see across the top, but also a popular host plant. Um, and so in the middle with the hole in the milkweed leaf and the face peeking through is a monarch butterfly caterpillar, of course, the best known uh, larva to host on milkweed. But also bottom left is a milkweed tussock moth caterpillar, um, a pair of them, and, uh, and a pair of beetles, both of which are milkweed specialists found only on milkweed and nothing else. The uh, milkweed swamp leaf beetle, bottom right, and the bottom center milkweed longhorn beetle. And there's, there's an entire book just on milkweed, the things that live in milkweeds. I just kind of scratched the surface here. And my slideshow is, that's funny, the practice run I did earlier, the slideshow had no problem advancing. It is being very slow here. Hmm. I may try exiting from exiting from the slideshow and advancing uh, advancing in the navigator if I can. Hmm. Like I also have no trace of my mouse cursor, so which is making things difficult. Uh, Ah, here we go. Finally, on to the next photo. Um, so um, here's another uh, sort of sort of a nectar nectar and host plant combination slide. 
I mentioned the moth before on the Budlia. And so we have the upper right-hand corner, actually two different, but closely related species of moths. And you see they have transparent windows in their wings. Uh, so that we have the, uh, the top center, the hummingbird clear wing and the top right snowberry clear wing. These guys often are confused with actual hummingbirds uh, if you know, seen in kind of low light or not seen well. They're, uh, they're members of the hawk moth or sphinx moth family. And you can see the caterpillar kind of a right hand middle um, has a horn on its butt. It is a horn worm uh, sort of distantly related to, to you know, the infamous tomato and tobacco horn worms. Um, the, the clear wings have a variety of plant state that their caterpillar will host on. Uh, many of them in the milk, in the honeysuckle family. Um, so not at all related to the things that the clear wings visit for nectar. Um, the bottom left with the two yellow flowers is our native, one of our native honeysuckle species. It's the Northern bush honeysuckle, um, genus Dervilia. Uh, which is a, a fairly common wild species and you can buy it at some nurseries around here. Bottom right, a species that's native to the southeastern US. Um, I don't think it gets all the way up to Massachusetts, though it gets close. Um, that is the coral honeysuckle, uh, Linicera sempervirens. Um, and uh, then the top left, you'll see something that looks very different, not at all a honeysuckle. That is a maple leaf viburnum. Um, and notice the honeysuckles all have kind of long tubular shaped flowers. Um, and the viburnum has a whole bunch of tiny flowers all arranged in a big flat surface. And this is uh, another kind of contrast I want to draw because um, these represent different pollinator syndromes, basically the the long tubular flowers, only a small number of pollinators can get nectar out of those flowers. And so only a small number will pollinate those flowers. Um, and the, whereas the big flat arrangement of small flowers, the nectar and pollen are readily available. And those will be visited by a large variety of different species. And so, and so we have some species that are more generalist. So across the bottom, we have the, the European honeybee. Um, that we heard about earlier. And bottom right uh, is a great golden digger wasp. Um, and then uh, upper right, one of the more specialized bees, it's an Andrina that, uh, it comes out in the early spring. I took that photo in the middle of April a couple of years ago. So um, should be emerging soon. Uh, comes out very early when there's only a few species of plants out. Um, Upper left, of course, is a hummingbird, and uh, they have very spe specialized selections of flowers. Um, not so much because the hummingbirds won't visit other flowers, but because the hummingbirds have less competition uh, when they go to their own specialty flowers and not the more generalized ones. Um, now, Russell mentioned Queen Anne's lace, and that's what we have here, just an illustration of how many different uh, pollinators will come. So Queen Anne's Lakes is one of the generalist type plants. I think the majority of the ones I'm going to discuss will be generalists. And then I've got a few specialist examples at the end. Um, but if the idea of gardening and landscaping uh, horrifies you, if you have no free time and not much disposable money, um, but you want to benefit pollinators anyway, uh, if you just sit back and do nothing, in most cases, the Queen Anne's Lakes will come up and the pollinators will follow. Um, so um, another one that takes very little encouragement usually is goldenrod. Um, and as you can see here, we've got a whole bunch of different uh, critters on goldenrod, bees, wasps, uh, beetles, longhorn beetles of a couple of kinds. Uh, bottom left, the creature there that looks sort of like a bee or wasp is actually a fly. It's a, one of my favorites, the feather-legged fly. So really brightly colored as flies go. Um, and top left goldenrod is also as a, is also a native species and so a host for the larva of many things. Um, that top left is one of my favorite caterpillars, mostly because of its name. Uh, 
because the goldenrod belongs to the same family as asters, yeah, asteraceae, uh, that caterpillar that eats them is called the asteroid. So um, another, uh, this is, if uh, you don't have a lot of space for wildflowers, if you're using your space all for things you can use in the kitchen, things you can eat or use for flavor, uh, you can still benefit pollinators. And uh, this is my wife's patch of spearmint right next to our front step. And uh, Ick Russell mentioned that the mints can be aggressive and spread a lot. So we'd have to weed around the edges at now and then to keep it from, uh, and keep it in an area that has stones all around the edges. But as you can see, all sorts of different pollinators will come to the spearmint. Uh, I've got a couple different butterflies here. The, uh, the great golden digger wasp is here again, uh, a longhorn beetle. Bottom left, which look, again, looks like a wasp, but it's not. It's a fly that's a wasp mimic to discourage predators from coming after it. Um, and the kind of top center below the, uh, below the butterfly, um, there's the black butterfly, which is a common sooty wing. Below that is actually a very small beetle, um, Macrosiagon, which you can see has some really, it's one of my favorites, has really elaborate antenna, um, like brushes or something. So, hmm. And there's someone in the waiting room, but because my mouse isn't showing, I'm not able to let them in. Um, oh, but I did go on to the next slide there. Okay, so now the spearmint, of course, uh, is a non-native species that we grow for our own benefit. Um, if you're a real stickler for native species, um, there is a native that's, a, that's just about as good for pollinators. Um, the mountain mint, Pycnanthemum, there's a couple of species of them. Um, and as you can see that actually top left is the same species of beetle I showed in the spearmint, Macrosiagon. Um, bottom right is, I believe that's one of the, let's see, that may be one of the potter wasps that builds a little clay ball for its larva. I'm not entirely sure of that. I'd have to double check that I'm recognizing the species there. And then a gray hair streak butterfly in the middle. Um, and the, the mountain mint not only benefits pollinators and is native, but uh, in my opinion, maybe the most glorious smell in all of nature is the leaves of the mountain mint. If you pick a leaf and roll it between your fingers, uh, the smell is just mind-blowingly wonderful. So um, let's see. Uh, one thing you can plant, you can buy at some nurseries and uh, some people do use uh, as you know, in some medicinal purposes or making tea. I've eaten the berries, they taste okay. Uh, elderberry, um, and this grows wild in a few areas. And um, another classic generalist uh, with the kind of flat collection of little tiny flowers. Um, bottom left, you see what looks like a bee, but is a bee mimic, a hoverfly um, visiting. And the top right isn't actually a pollinator or flower visitor, but a uh, creature that uses the elderberry as a larval host. That is the elderberry borer. Um, it's a longhorn beetle that whose larva kind of eat their way through the twigs and stems and trunks of the elderberry. Um, and as you can see, just a gorgeous creature when the adult comes out um, and was, as of about 10 or 15 years ago, was listed as a species of special concern in Massachusetts. Uh, they've taken it off the concern list um, more recently uh, as they've discovered uh, a few more populations of them and decided it wasn't as rare as they thought it was. Um, so spirea or meadow sweet, which I'm lucky enough to have a patch of this growing wild near uh, the Amethyst Brook Community Garden. Um, but you can also get uh, this species, a uh, spirea. It's depending on which biologist you ask, spirea latifolia or spirea alba, but the white, white meadow sweet. Um, it's a shrub, it's a woody plant, but not a very big one. And Another thing that on the left you see is uh, popular with pollinators, especially longhorn beetles. And uh, you've got three different species of longhorns in between those two photos, as well as several smaller beetles, which I think were tumbling flower beetles, um, also enjoying the flowers. 
Um, on the right-hand side, a case of not a pollinator, but another host plant connection. Um, and this is sort of a specialty of New England. Top right is the adult New England buck moth. Um, and, uh, and bottom right are the caterpillars of the, of the uh, New England buck moth, which um, uh, is a, another species you can't find in a lot of places. The buck moth is a really beautiful, striking creature. Um, and you need to have the meadow sweet around to have it because that's what its caterpillar is like. Um, this is another buck moth species that's even rarer than the New England buck moth. Um, it's an oak eater though, it eats scrub oak and is mostly found in the Montague sand plains and some other kind of sandy uh, piney woods habitats. Um, now, if your yard has any wet spots, if you have a backyard pond or near, live near a swamp, uh, one thing you can plant that's great for pollinators is button bush. Um, and uh, you can see the flower clumps and then go to seed. They look a lot like buttons, hence the name. Um, anyone who, uh, if you spend some time near Deerfield, um, there's a swamp there. I think it was behind Richardson's Sugar Shack. Um, but uh, just, uh, just outside of... Uh, I think just south of the old town of Deerfield, this large swampy area, hundreds of button, button bush plants growing in the swamp there. Um, it probably would not grow as well in, in dry areas though. Um, and so it's popular nectar plant, also host plant again, the bottom right is a plant I photographed in a, a swamp in Leverett behind the Quaker meeting there. Um, and the caterpillar really colorful is called um, turns into a moth called the smeared dagger, um, which dagger moths are actually pretty common around porch lights in the summer. Um, mostly you know, just kind of plain gray, the caterpillar in this case, much more colorful than the adult moth. Um, Echinacea or coneflower, kind of famed uh, for some of its medicinal properties that people use echinacea for. Also the a great, uh, plant for nectar. Um, as you can see here, the bees, the monarch butterfly, bottom center. Um, bottom left, there is a bumblebee, but also on the same flower. Uh, you can see the tiny creature up top, which is a, uh, a fly named Stylogaster um, that visits flowers. And is a, it's a bizarre little thing. Um, and top right, uh, with the bumblebee, I believe is another creature which actually is not a pollinator, it's a pollinator assassin, um, a creature called an ambush bug. And uh, if you're ever looking at flowers in the, especially in like goldenrods and such in the late summer, and you find a dead pollinator um, or pollinator that looks in a funny position, um, often it's being it's being eaten by one of these ambush bugs uh, or by uh, crab spiders or the other thing that likes, uh, likes to sneak around in flowers and grab the pollinators. So, but, uh, so if you, if you benefit, pollinate, benefit the pollinators, uh, you indirectly benefit the things that eat them. Um, now, speaking of medicinal benefits, the echinacea is known for medicinal benefits to us, but uh, here we have sunflowers um, and sunflowers uh, have medicinal benefits for the bees, actually help the bees resist a number of different pathogens that affect them and some of the, some of the, uh, the parasites that get into their nests. Um, so you can see I've got uh, several different bees here, the longhorn bee in the top right, the two beautiful metallic green critters in the bottom are uh, sweat bees, genus uh, family Helictidae. Um, top left is actually not a bee, that's a bee fly. So a fly that looks like a bee, uh, Geron. And then uh, top center, a group of bumblebees, which actually I was a, a day in October, it was very cold, it had just rained. The bumblebees, uh, if you look closely at them, are kind of wet and bedraggled. Um, and they all kind of clumped into that sunflower to ride out the bad weather and wait for the sun to come out. And, and of course the sunflower, because the flowers orient toward the sun and kind of reflect it, are a great place to wait for the sun to warm you up. Um, the other interesting thing I wanted to point out with uh, sunflowers, uh, you know, 
many people would look at a sunflower and say, wow, that plant's got, well, got a really big flower. And actually that's not true. If you look at the bottom right picture of the, one, of the, one of the green sweat bees, um, you'll notice that the middle there is not you know, a big flower. It's a whole bunch of tiny little flowers all packed together. And um, actually the big flat yellow things that look like petals of the flower are not petals. Those are actually flowers too, just flowers that develop in different shapes. So this is why uh, some people, rather than calling the aster family Asteraceae, call the family Compositaceae, the composite family, because what look like flowers to them are actually composites of lots and lots of little flowers. And that's why plants in this family tend to, when, you, when they go to seed, you get lots and lots of seeds out of each flower. Um, so, because uh, um, you get lots and lots of little flowers, each one makes a few seeds. Um, let's see, so that was the last of my generalist uh, pollination fla flowers, pollinated flowers. I wanted to do a few specialists here. And uh, here's one of my favorites. We have a, a couple of clumps of this in our yard here, the uh, Scarlet Bee Balm, uh, Minarda uh, didyma. I also have a, a related species, top left, the one that's not so intense red, but kind of pinkish purplish, is wild bergamot, uh, Minarda fistulosa. Um, the, the bee balm is a great favorite of hummingbirds. We see hummingbirds at these flowers almost as much as we see at our sugar water feeder. Um, they love it. As you can see also, uh, the bees will go after it. Bottom left, you see two different species of bees. The, uh, one of them is the longhorn bee, um, the other one, the European honeybee, sparring for nectar. Um, a butterfly, another one of the hummingbird clearwing moths in bottom right, and a great spangled fritillary on the bergamot at the top left. Um, um, this one, kind of like the coral honeysuckle, uh, buckeyes don't, as far as I know, grow wild are, na are not native to, new to Massachusetts, um, but they're native not too far away from Massachusetts, a couple of species, um, and, and so are available, and, and are available from uh, some local nurseries. Um, not this one so much, that th I didn't have a, I didn't have a lot of Buckeye uh, photographs to use, so this one is a painted Buckeye that I photographed down in North Carolina, but a uh, red Buckeye, I know you can get a grow around here. That's one that my wife and I planted at my sister's house several years ago. And the red buckeye at her house is a big, uh, a, again, a big a magnet for the hummingbirds because it's the long, narrow tube flowers that you know hummingbirds with a long beak and tongue can get nectar. Some butterflies have a long enough tongue, but a lot of other species can't get in there or what the bees will do if they want nectar from these is they'll chew through the base of the flower and steal nectar, but not, but they don't uh, get, they don't pollinate it at all. Um, bottle brush buckeye is another one. Bottle brush buckeye, I think might be the northernmost growing species and gets the closest to Massachusetts. Um, this one, I don't know if there's any nurseries that sell jewelweed. Um, it tends to grow pretty aggressively, especially in damp areas. So this one, like the button bush, is, uh, you know, prefers to have a, a little bit of some dampness around. Maybe the button bush sometimes likes to be actually in the water. The jewelweed doesn't like dampness that much, but it likes to be in muddy areas. Um, it has, you see the long hooked back of the flower. Um, it's got the nectar stashed back there in a hard to reach spot. Um, and so again, uh, hummingbirds love the jewelweed. It flowers just in time for them to be migrating south, um, kind of like the cardinal flower does. Um, uh, but bees also are a big fan of jewelweed. They can just crawl right into that flower um, and get to, get to the get within tongue licking range of the nectar, and also make contact with the pollen and spread the pollen around. And as some of you may know, this is a touch me not because when the seed pods get ripe in the fall, um, and if you kind of touch them or pinch them or flick them, the seed pods explode open and fling the seeds around. So, um, 
Here's one uh, I photographed up the road from us, uh, Obedient Plant. This is another more specialized one, mostly for bees. Um, and the, the pink flower tends to be, things with pink or purple flowers tend to especially gravitate bees toward them, as opposed to hummingbirds that uh, are attracted more to the red. Um, so, uh, so Obedient Plant uh, is another one that is a, a great bee specialist. A uh, good boost for your local honey, for your local bumblebees and such. Um, so, and I think my last one, and um, whoop, which I just made get smaller, um, wild indigo, a uh, baptisia, and this is another a real a real bee specialist for pollination, because um, the like many of the legumes, many of the plants in the pea family or bean family. Uh, the flowers are sort of closed up and it takes something as strong and kind of uh, manually dexterous as a bee to be able to push the flower open and get inside to where the nectar and the, po and the pollen are. Um, and um, in addition to uh, special, the, the uh, pollination, this is another one that's a, a host plant, in this case, a, butter, a very small uh, brown butterfly called the wild indigo dusky wing, which you see the, the adult uh, dusky wing at the top left and the caterpillar on some wild indigo leaves at the bottom right. Um, so, and this is another one my wife and I have planted right in front of our house. And uh, we get the dusky wing showing up a few times a year there. So, all right. And that is... Uh, the end of my sh end of my part of the show. So let's see. Josh, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank uh, Josh for all of those examples uh, and varieties that he presented to us. Um, we, uh, like I mentioned, um, we have recorded this, so um, you're going to be able to uh, to watch the uh, program uh, on our Hatfield YouTube site. Um, Hatfield Community TV. And so you'll be able to go back and uh, view Josh's uh, portion of the program to see all of those varieties that you can make notes on, then go and uh, uh, visit uh, your nearby uh, nurseries to, uh, to, uh, to take advantage of the information you've learned tonight to then go pick up uh, some of these uh, uh, some of these varieties at uh, the variety at the uh, nurseries here in our in our region. So I want to thank everybody for their presentations tonight, Allison, uh, Russell, uh, Harrison, and Josh. And I hope everyone enjoyed themselves. And uh, that's our program for this evening. So thank you very much. And again, uh, there will be a recorded version of this that you'll be able to watch and go back and uh, take notes. Um, and uh, uh, compare your notes to what uh, you uh, maybe missed uh, during the presentation, uh, and uh, that will be available on our webpage. So thank you, everyone. Good night.